I know that God is going to continue to bless and build your, uh, the kingdom of God through you. And may the Lord continue to bless you real, real good. All right. All right. Amen. 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 So we're here. Uh, I am here at uh, on Capitol Hill, just a few um, miles from uh, our president that needs our definite prayers. <laughs> and we are in a we are in a very, 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 very um, um, tenable and very um, tender scene and situation. Um, where, where lots of our emotions are raw because of some ill treatment. And we know that, uh, that we need to do those things. We need to pray, but we need to also do those things that will help to uh, solidify the justice that is in this area. So don't be afraid to do those things which are right. It's not anti-Christian. Just make sure uh, continue. Uh, there are... There, there, if you can just make sure that you mute all of your, just mute all of your phones and your devices so that there will be no interruptions. All right. All right. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? All right. All right. Tonight, uh, uh, we're going to deal with the topic, hope for our marriage hope for our marriage and so we're just going to start and we're going to pause right now with prayer spirit of the living god fall afresh on us as you have blessed each night lord bless tonight lord i cannot speak right till you come by here i can, the people will not hear right until you come by here so spirit of the living god fall afresh on us bless us in jesus name amen tonight I may say some things that will challenge and disturb you. I may say some things tonight. It's always going to be done in love, but you may agree or you might disagree. And that's okay too. But the bottom line, I want you to understand as we begin our journey tonight, as a whole, as a whole, we do not know how to make relationships work. So I think it's necessary, even on Zoom, even in the midst of this pandemic and this uncertain season, it's necessary to dialogue about it. Elder Mullins has already prayed uh, that the, the core for healing in our marriages, because the core of our communities is based on our families. So it's necessary tonight for us to dialogue about it. And I just want to bring uh, to your attention uh, and it's not an exhaustive list, but I want to bring to your attention because, because we do have hope for our marriages, at least seven components or, or principles that I will hopefully challenge you to help make our marriages survive. And let me just go beyond surviving, but thrive. Okay? I believe that God has called us to thriving marriages. Now, if you're single tonight, and you might be, uh, many people on this line may be single, I want you to challenge yourself, as well as the ones who are couples and marriages, this is not just for marriages, but, or the ones who are married, but make sure you write these notes down. If you have marriage on the horizon of your life, in your future, you need these principles that we will be talking about tonight. Because truth be told, too many get married for the wrong reasons. We, we, we marry persons for their, uh, I call it the three A's, for their appearance or their apparel or their assets. All right, all right, all right. In other words, <laughs> people get married over things that they have little or no control over. Because the truth is, you will not look the same in 15 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody young may not know that. But I'm here to tell you that the person that you are attracted to right now will not look the same way in 15 years. 
And let me throw this in for free. Whatever they are wearing today, chances <laughs> are they're not going to be able to fit in them 15 years from now. Yes. And, and you got to understand that whatever they are, they own right now, chances are they may have moved on from what they own now and they may have advanced to something different. Why? Because I want everybody to, to know that, that chances are the appearance, the apparel, and you got to understand that, 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 that the assets, things that they have, things that they really have no or little control over, it will be different. I guarantee you in 15 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, let, let me just, let me, let me just say this. I, I, I want to start with God's perspective and attitude on divorce because the divorce rate is no different in the body of Christ than it is in the world. One out of two marriages usually end in divorce. And, and the bottom line is, bottom line, divorces happen. It's not the impardonable uh, th they could be forgiven. There are things that happen. There are some, th some justifiable reasons why people do choose to divorce. But let me just start out with God's uh, perspective on an attitude on divorce. Uh, it, it's, it's right there in Malachi 2.16. It says, for I hate divorce. You need to know that God hates divorce. There's nothing that God likes about divorce. He's, he, he, he hates divorce. That's an amplified Bible. So, so you got to begin with how does God view, what's his perspective on divorce? He hates it. There's no joy in the very fiber of the being of our perfect God. He says, I hate divorce. Well, let me just start with some, 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 uh, some principles that will improve uh, your relationship and improve my relationship, our relationship, so that our families and our marriages will be strengthened. The first principle, you want to write it down, is the principle of commitment. The principle of commitment. You have to enter in, here it is, marriage, and it's a sacred commitment, with a committed attitude. Amen. Mm -hmm. For better or for worse. For richer, for poor, good times, bad times, in peace and in adversity. Now, Brenda and I, that's my wife's name, and I think she's listening. We have been married for, in, in August, 36 years. And I know that's chump change to many of you who are perhaps on the phone. And it may be a little bit more than some others, but we will have been married for 36 years. Now, we have a good marriage, but it's not a perfect marriage because uh, I'm not a perfect brother. But we made a commitment, here it is, that divorce on August 19th, 1984, we made a commitment that divorce was not an option. We're going to do this thing once and for all. And, and, and when, when, when I say that, in this culture, that type of of, of committed stance that I'm gonna hang on in there, it's missing from our culture. We don't have that mindset that marriage is a lifelong commitment. Now let's get serious. When two people get together, it will produce conflict. Now, some of you may not know this. Maybe you've never been in a serious relationship or even never been married. But let me throw this in. Let me inform you. Before you get back from your honeymoon, there will be some <laughs> conflict. Conflict will be somewhere in the picture. It's, it's just the way of life. You can't put two people under one roof, two different personalities, two different uh, temperaments, two different backgrounds, and not have some conflict somewhere, somehow. Mm -hmm. And one thing that helped Brenda and me stay together is, is that we made that commitment. Divorce is not an option. Divorce is not an option. 
Divorce Amen. is not an option. And, 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 and so I, 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 I want to go on record and let all my friends here in, in, at Dallas and, and this preacher of righteousness that you have, I want to go on record and let you know that we have never in 36 years considered divorce. I mean, M murder, murder, maybe murder, <laughs> maybe, but, but never, but never divorce. All right. First Corinthians 7, 10, 11 says, now to the married, I command yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. And it goes down to verse 39. A wife is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. So he, here it is. As long as you have it in your minds, watch this, that there's a way out of your marriage. In other words, you leave that door open that, well, if she gains weight or if he gets bald or if he loses his job or if she gets mean, I'm going to get out of here. As long as you have it in your mind that there's a back way out, your marriage will not survive because what you're doing, you're, 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 you're holding the threat of divorce over it. You have to make it up in your mind. Divorce is not an option. Let me, let me say this. There are biblical reasons and practical reasons why people do choose to be divorced. All right, but, but by and large, the bottom line is, if your marriage is going to survive, even though through those tough times, you have to start with an attitude of commitment. You got to begin with this mindset that when tough times comes, you will not say, what's my way out of this thing, but what's my way through this thing? So the first key is commitment because we're gonna be very practical tonight. The second key, if you want your marriage to move forward to the next uh, uh, level is communicate. Learn communication, and this is a lifelong process. And let me just say this, as I teach and speak, after 36 years, almost 36 years of, uh, uh, please don't think that, that I have uh, arrived when it comes down to being an expert on being the best husband or the best spouse. No, 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 these things, as I preach and teach, I am also listening. I, I, I'm better at many things and some things I will, but the bottom line is if in fact you are going to make it and thrive in 2020, even in the age of this pandemic, is you're gonna have to learn how to communicate. See, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I remember a story of a husband and wife, they were getting ready for bed and, and the wife was in front of a, a full length mirror and, and, and she was just looking and she looked so sad. And she says, you know, dear, I, I'm, not, I'm looking, I'm looking at the mirror and I'm looking at myself in this, this, this mirror. And, and, and you know what I see? He said, mm -hmm. he says, she says, I, I see an old woman. I, I see a face wrinkled. I, I, I see all this gray hair where it once was, was so pretty and, 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 and black. I, 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 I see, my shoulders are, are beginning to hunch over. I, I see all this flab on my, my, my arms and all my legs and all this cellulite. And, and so she just says, honey, can you just tell me something positive to make me feel better? And the poor husband, he pauses and he studies hard for a moment. He says in a soft, thoughtful voice, well, honey, uh, th th there's nothing wrong with your eyesight. Now, 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 I, I know he had to sleep on the couch tonight because he didn't know what to say. He didn't know how to communicate. But you got to understand, good communication is key. Because in relationships, we spend too much time, too much of our time trying to prove our points and be right so that we can be in charge. And sometimes we fail to realize good relationships practice good communication. Now, let me give you a tip because we could do three or four or five different messages just on communication. Let me just honk off a whole lot of it. Let me give you a tip for free. 
If you fact you want good communication, seek to understand first, then to be understood. Let me back that thing up. Seek to understand first, then to be understood. In other words, if you're the wife and if you're the husband and you are listening to each other at a particular time, make it your goal, wives, to understand where your husband is coming from. Make it your goal, husbands, to make sure you understand where your wife is coming from. In other words, you want to understand what's their concern, their pain, their issue. In other words, you want to understand what their perspective is. Then you want to be understood. James 1.19 says, so then my beloved brethren, let every man, here it is, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Three keys, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And it goes on, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's why, watch this, God gave us two ears, one mouth. So when you communicate, ask questions and do it with a sincere heart. Seek to understand and do it with a sincere heart. Because the problem is most of us, we don't listen well. What we usually do, and, and let's be honest, is, is you might be quiet while the other person is speaking, but what we're doing, we are busy thinking of our response. We're focusing on our comeback. But we cannot focus on the other person and focus on our comeback, what we're going to repeat, what we're going to say back at the same time. In other words, don't be so quick to give your opinion. Don't be so quick to give your thoughts or how you feel, uh, uh, how you want it. Don't, don't give away always the piece of your mind flying off the handle because watch, anger will not change anyone. It may modify a behavior for a time because the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If you're always mad, always cussing and fussing, you will not move forward in this area called communication. Ask yourself, do you criticize more than you praise? Mm. Ask yourself, do you take the time over the little things to say thank you to your spouse? Also, let me just say this before I move on. Try to create a why I see zone. I call it the no why I see zone. Why, watch this, is yelling. I is insult. C is cursing. In other words, when you communicate, make sure there's no yelling, no insults, and no cursing. And when that happens, you will find that you will begin to move further in your road to establishing a solid relationship. So number one, you want to, be, you want to make sure that you are committed because commitment is the first key. Number two, you want to make sure that you learn how to communicate. Be slow to speak, swift to hear and don't get mad so quick. Number three, conflict resolution. All right, commitment, uh-huh. Not only commitment, you have to make sure that you communicate well and effectively, and you do that by making sure that you seek to understand rather just always wanting to be understood. All right, conflict resolution. Um, let me just say this, conflict is usually fueled by PMS. Oh, 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 you thought it was that other thing. No, 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 PMS, that means either power, money, or sex, all right? Those are things that, that, that usually cause the most conflict in, in relationships, power, the need for power control, money, financial issues, or or the whole sexuality and sex piece, all right? There is stress in marriage because everybody wants to be in charge, power, all right? Everybody wants to be the head. 
But here is the key. Anything with two heads is a monster. <laughs> Let me just throw that, throw that, back that thing up. Anything with two heads is a monster. So let me challenge you. Instead of arguing, fussing, power playing, we ought to seek first and consult God and his word to see what he says. Because here's the problem. Let me just give it. Most of us are me-centered instead of God-centered. Most of us in our in ourselves, we are me-centered. Now, what is a me-centered person? You get up in the morning and you say stuff like this to yourself. I, what, am I, what am I gonna do today? Where am I gonna go today? What am I gonna eat today? Who am I gonna hang with today? What am I gonna wear today? In other words, that's all about the trinity of your existence, me, myself, and I. What am I going to do? You wake up in the morning and it's all about you. That's a me-centered person. And it's a very dangerous posture if you're in a relationship when it's all about me. But when you are a God-centered person, when you wake up in the morning as an individual who is blood-bought, twice born, what happens is this, is that you don't ask questions like, what am I gonna do today? Your first question is, God, what do you want me to do today? God, what do you want me to put in my body? God, where do you want me to go? God, what would you have me to do today? That, 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 that is the essence of this whole conflict resolution is submitting yourselves to God first and, and making sure instead of arguing and fussing and power playing, you, you're seeking God to see what he says, because the bottom line, it's all about him. God, how do you wish for me to treat my spouse? And when God begins taking control of your relationship, conflicts will begin to dissipate. Now, now let me just say, the best of marriages have disagreements, you have fights, you have arguments. But let me just say this, everything ought not be a fight. Choose your fights wisely. Some things are not worth fighting for. I, I, I remember, you know, I was just um, uh, uh, in my seminary, just got married. Maybe I've been married about a month or two. We we're in our little apartment in, in Berrien Springs, Michigan. I was in my second year of of seminary and we had just got married and Brenda was uh, in the kitchen, you know, she's cooking one of her meals. And one of the things that I love to these day, to this day, I love rice. I love rice. And, um, you know, I could eat rice almost every meal. Love rice, 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 brown rice, wild rice, you know, uh, white rice, just rice. I'm just, you know, I'm a credit to my rice. But the bottom line is, here it is. Brenda was in there and she was making some rice and you know, and she was rinsing the rice and she rinsed it once and she rinsed it twice and she rinsed it again and she was rinsing it some more. I said, that's enough rinsing. You know, I was playing and she said, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, I, you know, I, I, that's enough. I like my rice sticky. And she says, well, I, I, I like my rice fluffy. And I said, well, you know, I'm the, you know, man of the house, you know. I said, I like it sticky. And uh, she said, well, I like it fluffy. And she kept on rinsing. And I was, I was hotter than fish, fish grease down. I was, I said, I, how is she going to, you know? And uh, so I, 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 I was mad. And she kept on rinsing. And she started the rice. And so I, I wanted you to know that I, I wanted to make sure. I, I wanted to make sure she knew early in our relationship who was the boss. And so I, 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 I looked her straight in the eye. And I want you to know everybody on this phone and in this revival that she knows who's boss. And I've been loving 
fluffy rice ever since. <laughs> no, no, I want you to, but no, no, no. But I want you to understand. I want you to understand that 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 it every argument, everything you don't have to fight over. Fight over those things worth fighting for. Uh, and and the good news about it, after thirty six years, I, I am the the expert expert rice maker. Uh, uh, you know, I like it just in between. I like it sometimes fluffy. I just love rice and we made our compromise. But the bottom line is don't fight over every little thing. It's not worth it. Don't have a conflict. Choose your fights, your arguments, your times together and disagreements wisely. Some things are worth not fighting for. All right. Make sure that you move to being God centered. Number four, the fourth key is cash management, all right? We said commitment, communication, conflict, resolution, and now number four, cash management. Money, as many of you know, can be a married marriage breaker. But here it is. Most of us think that it is about the lack of money. Truth is, many couples have a management issue. It's the management of money that puts stress on relationships. Because if you cannot manage what you have, I found that God is not going to give you any more. Because it's very clear, it says he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? That's right there in Luke 16. But the bottom line, if you as a couple are wasteful and irresponsible with what you have now, you will do the same thing if you were to receive a little bit more. If you have little now, if you got a little more, the same thing will happen. In other words, if the little you have now is giving you all kind of stress, if you get a little bit more, you will just have greater stress. Mm. But if you demonstrate you can be faithful in little things, mm -hmm. God will know mm -hmm. you will be trusted with more. So let me just give you three quick keys in this cash management. First of all, be faithful to what God commands. Many of us know on this line that God has commanded us to be faithful with our tithes and offerings because everything that we have belongs to him. Your house, your car, your job, your money, your things, it all belongs to him. He says, let, let, let's have a trusting relationship. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, let you manage 100%. Now, we're going to make an agreement that 10%, 10 cents out of a dollar, I'm going to ask that you faithfully, cheerfully return back. And God says, I will bless you to overflowing. You have so many blessings, you will not have room enough to receive. So number one, be faithful to what God commands. Number two, um, let me just challenge you to get a budget. Get some type of a budget. Got to know what's going in, what's coming out. You got to know your bills. Get some kind of budget. Get some help. There's a lot of things online. You could talk to your pastor. You could talk to a, a financial specialist. Make sure you get a budget. But thirdly, get on the same page, couple. You got to move together in, in finances. You, 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 some people have separate accounts. If that works for you, that's fine. But just get on the same page. Move together. Operate as a team. Why? Because God loves unity. And somebody here needs to ask God to breathe life into your situation. And the beautiful thing is, is that God will do just that. So make sure to do those three things. Be faithful to what God commands. Get a budget and get on the same page. And if you start there, you're going to see God begin to bless you even in your finances, even in the midst of this pandemic. The fourth key is, watch this, intimacy. Intimacy. The fifth key, excuse me, is intimacy. All right? Is intimacy. Now, intimacy 
goes beyond just sex. All right. Some of you brothers need to know that. All right. Now, I want to challenge everybody, if you don't have it, it's a classic book. Most people have it in their Christian homes. Um, so get, get that book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. What he proposes is, is that most of us, we see and receive love through one of the five languages. In other words, uh, we feel love the best either through words of affirmation, through acts of service, through physical touch, through quality time, through, through uh, 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 gifts, okay? In other words, words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, physical touch, quality time. You might love to hear words of affirmation. Some of you are thinking that if I work two or three jobs, brothers, that I'm going to get a strong and solid and loving response from my wife. And so you're working two or three jobs and you're giving her gifts, but her, her watch this, her need or her love language is words of affirmation. So she hears and feels love the best when you share with her kind, affirming, uplifting words. And you're trying to show your love by giving her gifts. You're not speaking her language. Mm -hmm. I challenge everybody to get that book and learn your spouse's love language. Because if in fact, watch this, if your love language is physical touch, men, and your wife's always trying to give you quality time, let's, let's just, no, no, no. There is that, that, that miscommunication because everybody is wired one way or the other. And most people have a top two. But I challenge you to get that book from Gary Chapman. It is, is, is from a biblically derived formula that God had given him years ago. And it is a challenge. So it's Gary Chapman. It, has, it is called... It is called the five love languages. But when I talk about intimacy, I repeat, it is not just about sex. Now, now don't get me wrong. Sex is important. Can I get a witness? Some of the brethren, can I get a witness? All right. Now, now I thought the men in the house would at least uh, put in the chat amen. room. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, uh, because the Bible says that the husband rendered to his wife, the affections do her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Do not deprive. That's in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5. You want to put that down and read that. All what I'm trying to say to you, brethren, and I'm just going to give you, wives, just close your ears. I'm going to give your husband some, some free advice tonight. If you give your wife sincere affection during the day, it will make your nighttime a blessed time. In other words, hey, hey, hey brethren, the, 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 the relationship, the intimacy, the, the joy, the fire do not start at night. During the day, if you send us some emails and if you just throw some compliments her way, some thank yous, and if you give a quick call sometime during the day, flowers and chocolates and do some honeydews that she did not expect. Uh, you see, See, you just can't go through all the day without any meaningful contact and then expect at night fireworks in the bedroom. You have to set the stage, brethren. And brethren, if you need a little help, get some help. So husbands, talk to her. Listen to her. Hold her hand. Walk in the park. Hear her heart. And it, and if you give her the affection when the time comes, I believe she will glad, gladly give what's due you. And, and let me just talk to the sisters just for a moment. If the brother is trying to do better, take those rollers out, go to, to, to Vicky's and, and, and say, hook a sister up. See, see, Christians 
have a component in marriage that the world does not have. We literally can bring Jesus into our bedroom. And wherever Jesus is, there's joy. Wherever Jesus is, there's peace. Wherever Jesus is, there's victory. So intimacy ought to be a joyful experience. Glory, hallelujah. Somebody ought to say amen, amen, amen. The sixth principle is the principle of forgiveness. There are four phrases I want you to make sure that you have at your disposal. You wanna practice them. They're not easy statements. They're simple, but they're not easy. The first statement is, I love you. The second sta statement is, I'm sorry. The second, the third statement is, please forgive me. And the fourth statement is, I forgive you. Four statements that you're going to have to learn to say over and over in marriage. I love you. I'm sorry, because we all fail. Please forgive me. And the last one is, I forgive you. You have to understand that the Bible says in Mark, the 11th chapter, verses 25 and 26, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Here is the clincher. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. You need to learn to forgive If for no other reason that you may also be forgiven. Because if you do not forgive, it literally blocks God from being able to forgive you. And forgiving others means forgiving your spouse. We all blow it. We, we all make mistakes. We all say things, do things that God is not pleased with. Now, let me just make sure that I know and you know that I know that forgiveness is, is not just this forgive and forget or that it's all instantaneously okay. But forgiveness is this. It is simply giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. Let, let that turn, turn down the fire and let that simmer for a second. It is, listen, it is simply giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. It is the process of, of framing one's anger and hurt from the past with the, with the goal of recovering one's peace in the present and realize one's purpose and hope mm -hmm. for the future. Forgiveness is turning the situation over to God and trusting him to bring restoration to your relationship. Now, now if in fact you are the one who is being forgiven, Mm -hmm. If you are the perpetrator, if you're the one who wronged your spouse, it's important for you who is forgiven to show remorse and to show a pattern of change. Why? Because if somebody continues to be hurt over and over and over and over again, either verbally, either physically, emotionally, it is difficult, here it is, to build trust. But if you are genuinely trying to come back to that godly oneness, then over time, healing and restoration will take place if you are committed to changing the behavior. I like to put it this way. You can only do that if you know Jesus Christ. 
Because when you have legitimately, here it is, if you've legitimately encountered the Savior, you will automatically change your behavior. You cannot talk about, well, I, I'm sorry, and, and you're still abusive. And you're still unkind. And you're still acting irresponsible. And you're still perpetrating the hurt. And you're still not trying to be delivered from the stuff, the habits that has caused the crisis. But I want you to understand that when you do forgive, and the person who is being forgiven takes God and the relationship serious, I want you to know that God is still in the restoration business. And the seventh key is the key of submission. Uh, Ephesians 5 says, and be not drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, in your heart to the Lord, submitting, here it is, to one another in the fear of God. Wives, to your own husbands. For the husband is head of the wife. So also Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as a church is subject to Christ, let every wise be subject to their own husbands. And it goes on. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands, make sure you love your wives as your own bodies. And he who loves his life loves himself. I want you to know there are three types of submission and submission just simply means to line yourself underneath the other person and literally push them up so that they may always look good. It is volunteering to get behind your spouse and to push him or her up. It is a selflessness that says that, watch this, I'm going to decrease so that my spouse may increase. And it is the husband saying that my primary responsibility is to get behind my wife and to push her up so that she could be the best that God has created her to be. It is the wife saying, no, I'm all about my career and my thing and my feelings. It, her, 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 her number one goal is to get behind her husband and to push him up. And so it's a selflessness that says, submission says, that I'm volunteering, getting behind and making my spouse looks good so that ultimately God can get the glory. It is a selflessness that says, okay, hey, I am going to lower myself so that my spouse can get the spotlight. So that means that my spouse, Brenda, her job is to promote me. That means me I, my duty, my goal, my challenge, my charge for my God is to get behind her and make sure that she's promoted so that she can get the spotlight. It is not a battle. It is not a tension. It is not a contention. It is not a conflict. But we selfless, because submission says, watch this, it has to be mutual submission because it says submitting yourselves. Then it has to be not only mutual, but it, it's relational submission. Relational submission says one to another. All right? 
Now, you might say, well, it says wives submit. Until, no, 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 no. Before it said wives in verse 22, in verse 21, it says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So before, here it is, there was given an injunction that wives were to especially submit to their husband. God had already given Paul to say, hey, you guys got to submit one to another. So there's mutual submission. There is relational submission, but then it says, submitting yourselves one to another. Here, in the fear of God, there is also reverential submission. Let me just put it this way. Submitting yourselves one to another because of your love of God. That simply means if your marriage, my marriage, our marriages in these last days are going to survive and thrive, God must be put first. Because the bottom line is there's going to be a judgment. And when your name comes up in judgment, God's going to ask you, my brothers, how have you handled my property? Because if, if your marriage is God's marriage, and I hope it is, your wife is not just your stuff or your meat or your prop. No, no, that's God's property. So God's going to ask you, how, hey, how, how have you handled my property? Why did you choose to physically abuse my property? Why did you mishandle my property? Why, why, why did you put work over her? He's going to ask you, how have you handled his property? Wives, God's going to ask you, how, how did you handle my property? Because... If, if you've been married under the banner of God, your husband is not your man. He is God's property. And he's going to ask you how, how you handled his property. Why, why did you always find it necessary to, to open up your mouth in public and to embarrass him and to degrade him? Why did you never use your mouth to build him up? He's going to ask you, how did, how did you handle my property? You, you, you put your career over your marriage? I challenge you, everybody here today, that God wants relationships that he can bless and that can mirror to the world his love for humankind. But if that's going to happen, God must be put first. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're so grateful for these simple tools that allow us to gain a hold on our marriages that sometimes are less than desirable. So in the name of Jesus, we are coming here today thanking you for your grace and your mercy. So Lord, right now, we're just asking that you would renew our commitment to you first and to one another. Teach us the principles of communication. Help us to move through conflict in a way that will be beneficial. Lord, give us uh, an awareness of our finances and help us to manage our cash so that you may be glorified. Lord, give us a, a knowledge of uh, godly intimacy and help us to do those things which would build up rather than tear down. But most of all, God, give us hearts of forgiveness because we all have said, done, felt things that have not been pleasing to you, would you 
help us to begin to uh, exercise godly forgiveness to our spouses so that we can begin to repair the broken spots and spaces of our relationships so that we may not only survive, but to thrive, breathe love into our homes and give us that submission that only comes from putting you first. I thank you, Lord, for Pastor Boyd. Thank you for his vision. I'm asking that you bless each family that is on this line and beyond. And when you come, help us to be found hand in hand with you and with each other. I thank you, Lord, for your simple word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen.